Hello everybody and uh, welcome to the 147th edition of the Frank and Stan chat and uh, we started these in 2020 and uh, you get through the week and you wonder I wonder what we're going to chat about this week and then suddenly it's Friday morning and everything hits the fan so uh, <laughs> it's it's not been a quiet week but it really has got very very active and busy and interesting in the last few hours so um, I'm I'm delighted to be able to say we've got uh, Andy Stanier uh, as our guest this week. Hello, Andy. Good morning. Good morning. We'll come to you in a minute and ask you to just sort of tell everybody who you are and what you've done and the stuff you're doing at the moment. But I'll go to Stan and say hello, Stan. How are you? I'm very good. Um, we had some news. We 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 just hinted at the last few. We weeks, did. But yeah. Can you can you go public with it now? Yeah, I'm officially a grandfather now. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, I, uh, oh. My son and his wife went through the adoption process. Uh, it's taken a long time and it's a it's a heck of a process to go through. I wouldn't I wouldn't wish the process on anybody, but the outcome is fantastic. So yes, I'm finally a granddad. So that's, brilliant. That's and and can you can you reveal the name of the uh, of your name? Uh, probably shouldn't yet. Right, okay. But, but maybe maybe soon maybe soon all right yeah. okay i'm just conscious that that my, the family haven't done anything on social media oh uh, right yeah of course i don't want to preempt them all no 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 but, that's, uh, that's well congratulations uh, yeah it's yeah uh, i know fantastic. there's been a, a few tears and a few ups and downs along the way hasn't it? it's been a quite a long oh, journey i think it's been a um an emotional roller coaster of a journey from um people won't know that but sometimes during the adoption process you get to just at the point where you've seen a child that is up for adoption. You have all the details, seen videos, photographs, even even met them informally. And they call it passing, and then told, no, actually, it, it's not going to happen. Right. Or the courts decided a different approach. So it's almost like a, um, it, it's almost like a death. It sounds over the top that, but. Once you've built yourself up to this particular child, and, and you know we'll be adopting him in a few weeks' time, to no, I'm sorry, the there's something wrong with the paperwork that puts it back so many weeks that it's it's out of the question now. Right, right. And they went through that a couple of times. Wow. Well, I'm I'm delighted. It's you know this is all yeah, it's fantastic. now. And, uh, we, we look forward to hearing names and everything in due course. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Andy, thank you so much for joining us. It's, I, I've been trying to get you on for about a year, I think it is. Um, would you just like to introduce yourself and perhaps explain what you're doing now and how we know each other? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I live in Stoke-on-Trent and I've spent virtually all my life involved in education in the city with a brief three-year break when I went to Nottingham University many moons ago. I'm currently the chairman of the Stoke-on-Trent Association of School, College and Academy Leaders. Quite a mouthful, that, or SASCL, as it's known. Uh, it's a role I've had since 2014 when I thought I'd taken retirement. Um, but I was sort of asked to, to come back into this. I'm also chair of governors at the primary school that I attended, my daughter attended, and my grandson now attends. <laughs> So there's been links there. But, and prior to this, I was the principal at the Co-op Academy of Stoke and head of the predecessor school, Brown Hills High School. And with Cathy Lever in Manchester, we were at the start of the Co-op Academy's movement or revolution, perhaps, <laughs> as the first two academies were in Stoke and Manchester. Uh, we opened in 2010, inspired by, this, I think, the vision of Mags Bradbury and Russell Gill. And in my case, supported by my chair of governors, Mike Greenacre. And as you're aware, it's grown significantly since yeah. then. I was party to your appointment. I was on that interview panel um, back in about, was it 2013? 2012. I think. Uh, 2013 it was. Yeah, 2013. Yeah, yeah when, when you joined as the, the first chief exec and it became the Co-op Academy's trust then, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, yeah. It's funny, I, I, I forget about that recruitment process. It was... 
because it was something I never really thought I was going to ever do when I left Ofsted. I thought, well, that's it now. I'll just sort of, you know, wander into retirement sort of thing, you know, just work my way through. <laughs> um, but that but that opportunity when it arose, I mean, it was just, there was something about the timing of it and about the sense of uh, the opportunities that were available. And uh, yeah, and it's amazing, isn't it? The way that that academy in Stoke has, has grown from being a school that, actually probably wasn't one of the, the the top on the list of choices for parents it's it's now, it's now oversubscribed and you know doing amazing things yeah i mean i was in the privileged position of designing a new school and how it did operate you know moving from the school to the academy with obvious requirements and limitations and the influence of the co-op group on that and that was from 20, 2008 to 2010 really and then in 2012, we opened as a brand new school and brand new building. So from 2010 to 12, I was then fortunately again involved in sort of the designing along with others of that building to deliver the vision that we'd got. And that was, you know, that was enlightening to put it mildly. Yeah. And I mean, and underpinning it was that sort of the co-op's vision at the time of how schools should operate and where we would go. And it was quite an influence, particularly from mags and mike you know engaging with the students engaging with parents in that process to come up with you know the you know how the school would work and what the building would be like so it was it was an interesting time and you know i suppose an opportunity very few heads or or people get to have in their career so i was very lucky there yeah it's yeah. interesting it's as if this was all planned but it wasn't in this way but last week helen carroll from the co-op um we don't it's not a co-op sort of uh, blog this by the way just happened the way it worked out but helen is a senior manager in the co-op and she's chair of governors now of a new um secondary academy in manchester that the co-op has built um with dfe funding i should add but the thing is is that um she was talking about how it, it, how important it is to set the tone and the sort of the approach you have this up there's probably one opportunity to get it right you know yeah. in, when you open this new school and it was interesting the way she was talking about how they're how they're trying to do it there yeah i think they have she's got the advantage over yeah. most schools particularly secondary schools in that they're taking a cohort through so right they, yeah they, it's that yeah. bit of you know that, that first cohort sets the tone then probably for the next 20 years so get it yeah. right with them and you you've really cracked it i think yeah. and that's an advantage that many schools really don't have do they no I mean, all yours, yours transfer overall in one go because the the school was built wasn't it in front of the old one or that's right again we we built the new school on the playing fields and continued in the old school. Then during the summer moved across completely and then demolished the old school where the playing fields then became. You can imagine that Sport England kept a close eye on what we were doing. <laughs> uh, equally, the, the school originally, Brown Hills High School had been a grammar school for girls, opened in the late twenties. And there was still a lot of old girls around and tradition who were very upset and disappointed at us knocking down you know their old school we did invite them in prior to, to doing it and gave them the run of the building and it was quite interesting that was so i think there were effigies of me around the city well around the world to be honest <laughs> that had pins stuck in them <laughs> that time. right well the brick i always say give us a brick to remember it by <laughs> well, we did actually did you? because probably in the, in the old school they had what was called the black and white tiles which ran across in front of the head teacher's office and the students weren't allowed to to go on the black and white tiles they had to do a complete circuit of the school to get around in case the head was disturbed <laughs> so we actually sold i mean i got my business manager lynn was very in, enterprising we actually sold the tiles to these ladies who, who lapped them up and we, we gave it to the, the money all went to the um, a local the donna louise uh, trust in the city which looked after young children so yeah the, the the funding from the tiles went to a good cause <laughs> <laughs> right okay um stan there's uh just in the last was it eight hours six hours quite a lot's happened yeah. so uh, what's caught your eye this week Stan? well <laughs> amanda spielman's put out a, a statement uh about chain potential changes to to ofsted in light of the recent tragedies and I think in light of the growing 
concern that Ofsted have lost their, their direction. Uh, but particularly, she talks about tweaks to the set the way they inspect safeguarding. Um, and the, the letter is not a particularly good letter. It's not a particularly well written statement. It contradicts itself in a couple of places. But the tweaks, one of the tweaks suggested is that maybe some of the things that schools have gone into a category on are things that could have been fixed very quickly, i.e. administrative things. And therefore, she thinks maybe Ofsted could come back much sooner to those schools to correct correct the record, if you like. To, to I, I don't think she's suggesting a reinspection. I think she's suggesting that if if it was, let's say, the single central record wasn't wasn't completed, that the school does that, and then the inspection outcome is changed by letter. I don't suppose the report would be changed. I don't think it can. Well, be. come on, Stan. We we've done a lot of inspections. Yeah, have done a lot of inspections. If you start to to at a later date to provide more evidence about effectiveness, surely that team needs to come back and consider in the round the overall judgment that was awarded. I cannot see how we can have a system that actually sort of just picks out one segment of an inspection and then says, well, we're going to change the report just to around perhaps two sentences or three maybe, sentences. Maybe, Frank, what you can, you can do is stop that being a limited judgment, limiting mm. judgment. So well, safeguarding, therefore, it, we've corrected that. So leadership now is no longer inadequate and the school is no longer inadequate because this has been corrected. Yeah. Now, I, I said, I think, last three or four weeks, that there are things like that that can be fixed straight away. I, I know of inspections and inspectors who are a bit more sort of wise in my view that say, can you correct that today? And if you can correct it today, it's not an issue. Uh, and it, it, I know it's been done. You know, I, I know one school where they wanted a check on the governors that weren't barred. You've, you've not done a check on your governors to see if they're barred. Well, I think there's about six in the country that are barred. The chances of a school having them mm -hmm. is pretty slim, but they haven't mm -hmm. done the check. So they did the check and then that wasn't part of the report, but would have been. And what I've been thinking, I think I said last week, it's all right us all whinging about Ofsted, but we need to we need to talk about an alternative. We need not too Ofsted, because I don't think you can ever get rid of, of a, an no. inspection of schools. I, 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 I actually believe that inspection works. Um, when done you've well. You've got to take the pressure off the school. Mm. So what I've been looking at as a different approach is how much better the desktop inspection could be done before the school's even aware that anybody's looking at anything. And, you know, if safeguarding is this massively important thing, then it can't be left to Ofsted to do because Ofsted only come between three and five years. So it, I, I propose that there should be an audit over things like safeguarding on health and safety, maybe an even annual audit done via the, the um, local authority or MAT. And by that, I don't mean them doing it. I mean, commissioning experts to, to do that. So that schools have an up-to-date, at least a year within the last year of a safeguarding audit, pupil premium audit, uh, health and safety audit, things like that and all those contribute to the desktop review so by the time the desktop review is done it's a whole picture of the school that the inspectors mm -hmm. coming up with and then the outcomes of that are shared with the school prior to anything so the first notice that the school gets of inspection is we've been looking at your desktop we've been looking at all these things these are the issues that we are raising and in, in that would be the school self-evaluation, which I think should be in a... In should, a be the heart, should be the heart of it, shouldn't it? Well, yeah, so that should be in like a portal, <clears throat> yeah. a portal that, that you update online that Ofsted can have access to all the time. And then once the school gets what the views are, they can respond by saying, oh, yeah, you're right about that, but we've corrected it. No, you're wrong about that. We've done this and that. <clears throat> now, our priorities have changed slightly in the light of... And then that then, the next part is the phone call, which is a professional conversation. 
it's not a trying to trick you. It's not we're going to try and find out what you... It's actually, well, I've looked at your self-evaluation. Your priorities seem to be the right thing. What actions are you actually taking? What have you done? Is it making a difference? And, and that be the, the, the process. And then finally, a visit, which would not need anything more than a day because it would be just to make sure that what's yeah. being said yeah. is reflected yeah. and to get a feel for the culture of the school. Yeah. And then finally, a two-stage report a letter to parents that says this is what we found about your school and a professional report to the school to say this is what we think this is what you think we should be doing next this is where you, you know you might want to get the help and support from you might want to look at these this research that's been done so it's a professional document it can go on the school's website so those that are interested can read it but written for professionals as opposed to written for the average sun reader as yeah, we were told yeah. when we were inspecting go on andy what do you think of that wow <laughs> but, i mean it, it it opens so many areas doesn't it really and and an area that links to that to me is certainly the safeguarding element is is crucial and um and it would certainly take things forward to me, I think something that concerns me is over the actual educational outcomes and how they're judged. And yeah. educational outcomes purely based on GCSE performance or A-level performance, I think is so limiting. You know, pupil destinations would be a much more accurate reflection of how well a person has been educated within a school. And, you know, those going on to sixth form or university, those going on to apprenticeships, sports, musical areas, I think would be a, a, a better way of deciding how a school are performed in terms of, you know, educating their youngsters. I think here you've got sort of NEETS as potentially a defining uh, judgment as, as a way of doing that. But linked to that, of course, is the individual stories of those youngsters. And I think schools would know those individual stories, you know, mm -hmm. around attendance, around, you know, how they've performed in the school. So sort of linking the two might be might be a way forward. So. Yeah, it's interesting when we talk about fa it, uh, they use the word failure now. And I noticed on Schools Week that uh, the article this morning it talked about failing schools, and actually it is an inadequate school. And there used to be this term: a school required you know, the lowest grade special measures in order to provide satisfactory education for its pupils. That was the the phrase around special measures. But whenever I've inspected, I've always seen special measures as a systemic failure. You know, like, this is actually a school that actually doesn't know where it's going. It, it, it isn't very well led. It's, and, and those are things that actually lead to these safeguarding concerns. You know, that for me is a, is a significant concern. This is not, systemic failure is, to me is not about finding, you know, that they're in the case of one, I think, one trustee i think of a of a trust that was done recently one trustee hadn't been they hadn't checked on some on the company's uh, uh uh file as to whether or not they'd been registered as a trustee company house you know these sorts of things are are, are not systemic failures they they're sort of pickouts aren't they mm. of things that might you might want to pick out if you're trying to get something over the line for it to be considered to be inadequate so the systemic thing is across the board for me, you know, and, and some of the weaknesses that we've seen um, that 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 report of a school of the primary school, it that that would have rung a lot of alarm bells for me on a QA desk about this doesn't feel systemic. This is a bit I mean, and we don't know the details. I'm not going to go into that, but that would have really rung a, a lot of alarm bells for me. And there's no there was no uh, problem in actually revisiting as off, you know, chief inspectors can do what they like, you know, to go back to schools where there is a system, where there is identification of a what appears to be a minor weakness, you know, um, to go back and, and do further work on it, you know, to see in the, in the gap between that visit and the original one, whether or not any changes or improvements have been made. We've lost this sense of the systemic nature of weakness in schools, and there aren't many of those around. You know, I think the idea that, you know, I think the, the general public think there are a lot of weak schools. There are not. There are very few and far between. When you talk special measures, Frank, I, I always used to interpret that and I know the, as the school isn't capable with it on its own of, yeah. of getting these things fixed. 
So again, the, the truth of the matter was, it was self-evaluation. It was about whether the school was aware enough of its own strengths yeah. and weaknesses and had the capacity to improve. And, and if there are schools like that, and there aren't many, then there is a case for saying you need some additional support and we are going to broker X, Y. Instead of spending millions inspecting loads of schools, yes. put a few hundred I, thousand into some really schools that really need it yeah. and make a difference to the lives of those children. But I had included in my model the, the, the opportunity after the response from the school and after the day visit, no, sorry, after the phone conversation, they could opt for a much deeper inspection based on the context of what they'd yeah, found yeah, out. Yeah, so yeah. if there was a case of, wow, this is looking really uh, unsafe. Yeah, it, it could it could be a systemic issue. Yeah. So, but, so yeah, then we yeah. move to what would be, I suppose, the equivalent of a, of a Section 5 inspection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Um, there was also an announcement today from Amanda Spillman about... Um, currently outstanding scores that have been exempt from inspection for a long period of time would actually two things get a bit of notice as to when they're going to get done and secondly be those senior leaders be invited to a seminar or something oh, to explain yeah. now i have to say <laughs> um getting on my, i remember about 2008 um being in a very senior meeting in Austin. i produced a paper um, which said that academies at the time were going to be given three year were being given three years gap between yeah, yeah. from the time of opening to their first inspection when all other schools were going to be given are uh, given two years and I said I cannot understand and also those academies were also getting a preliminary and interim visit mm. um, as if to say they were going to be specially treated from all the other schools simply because they were academies and what we've got now i think with this suggestion we're going to treat these previously outstanding schools who've not had any of the hassle and trouble of inspection over the last 10 12 years so i'm going to treat them as a special they get a special pass we're going to let them know you know and, and, and you say the day but you know it's going to be in this window because you'll know that in it with if you're invited to our seminar then you're probably lined up for your inspection folks you know I, can't, I cannot believe that anybody thought that was a really good idea. I found that amazing that we're going to treat those schools yeah. completely differently from those that are, you know, run of the mill schools, not been outstanding, whatever. You know, where's so that you think, from? Frank, if you're the Minister for Education coming up to a general election and the statistic is 85% of schools that used to be outstanding are no longer outstanding. That's not one you want to stand up and shout about, is it? <laughs> so I think they've got to change that system fairly rapidly. Yeah, but actually it's truth to power though, Stan, isn't it? Yeah. We have lost that. We have lost, we do not have at the moment a chief inspector who appears to want to stand up and speak on behalf of the findings of her inspections. You know, because we are not reading about stuff about there's a funding crisis. There's a mental health crisis. We can't get ECHPs through. We've got uh, uh, an over-reliance on test data, you know, the, the recovery and all the experiences that children are having in years five, six, years nine, 10 and 11. You know, all of this, none of that is, is coming out in these reports, you know, because that's unpalatable. You know, we, we've really got a situation here where inspectors are actually in effect, not writing about the things that they're seeing and writing about the things that Ofsted wants them to see. And when we talk about Ofsted, it, it, because of the closeness with government, we're talking about this is what we want the government to tell parents that they're going to see. You know, I, I think we're, we're in a we, and I said to you before, I feel for the first time deep, getting to be deeply embarrassed about ever being an HMI, and I never thought I'd reach that situation. But I'm feeling that now, big time. Mm -mm. <laughs> looking at Andy who's li listening to that rub there patiently for <laughs> 10 minutes <laughs> go on Andy bring me down follow, uh, follow that <laughs> <laughs> I was actually on the senior leadership team of a school that went into special measures way back in 2002 and at the time that the head there you know, didn't go the head kept the post and we worked together and we took that school out of special measures. 
the indicator which put us in special measures was the academic performance of the school. I mean, back in those days, if you could hit 20% 5 A to C, not including maths and English, you were okay. You know, <laughs> we weren't. <laughs> but, but the rest, everything else about the school was very, very positive. You know, you talk about that overall picture, the safeguarding where the youngsters went on to. I mean, there were a totally different set of pressures in, in, in 2002 because to start with, there were the job opportunities there for the youngsters to go to and, yeah. and the college places. Um, and so it just seems that very often it's very much down to one area of that inspection which can skew the whole picture, be it academic performance, be it safe, rightly safeguarding, obviously if the, if the safeguarding is not right, but it just seems to be one area can totally skew. And, and more often than not, I mean, going back to my earlier point, yeah. it's very much about that academic performance, isn't it? And when you've got a system which anyway limits the number of youngsters that are going to get certain grades, you know, inevitably that, that system is flawed. Yeah. 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 And I think now that because they've not been able to use certainly in primary results for the last few years, so it's, it's on curriculum, they're actually guessing where, how yeah. well the children ah. are going to do based on on what they have seen of the curriculum which was is entirely the opposite of, <laughs> of what i was trained in which was outcomes are the most important thing yeah. so it's not how you do it it's what it's what you get the outcome now i believe there's the, the important bit about schools is the how bit how what experiences do we provide for children how are we teaching them how are we making sure that they remember stuff or how are we making sure that they understand, which I think is slightly more important, that they understand how things work and, and become people who can work in, in a civilised society? That That's the how that isn't being judged at the moment. Yeah. There, there seem to be sort of topical areas of focus. And I think at the moment, from what I, having, again, just gone through an inspection at the primary school and at just shortly after that, listening to an HMI talking to Stoke secondary heads, reading seems to be the be all and end all at the moment, you know, on, on inspection and phonics in particular, which I must admit, I grew up when phonics didn't exist or they must have been there, but I didn't, they, they weren't sort of driven. Phonics and reading seem to be the areas of focus that now are above all other, you know, certainly in the primary and in the earlier stages of secondary. I don't know was, if you found yeah, there was a, a really, really, I think, a really deeply troubling report came out this week from Ofsted, written by Lee Alston, who's the deputy uh, uh, schools manager in Ofsted, about uh, reading, early reading for children with special educational needs. Now, I, I what worries me here is that there was no reference at all to any inspection findings from in that report nothing you know and and lee i, I mean I, I know lee um nice guy good hmi obviously very keen you know but actually ofsted shouldn't be writing about stuff that they haven't directly seen that's you know in a way they're unable to reference anything because i'm not I, I mean i read hundreds of reports every week i'm not reading anything about that I'm not reading anything about that. And, and it's, it's, it's in a way the ideology that sits behind all of this, that's, that's seeped into Ofsted and the way that it works. You know, instead yeah, well, of saying got, no preferred practice stand, remember that? Well, have you seen the early years report where it talks about children, let me get this right, not, not writing at a, at a level beyond which they can read. read and also that this might be, you know, supported by dictation. Dictation to four-year-olds. I know. Who who's writing that stuff? I know. Well, the thing is, I don't know about you, but I'm the book I'm reading at the moment. Arrived at, to, uh, yesterday is this because I've got a, sem a symposium I'm going to attend in June. It's called End State. All right. I'm not, it's not the the book itself is not important, but there may well be words or phrases used in that book that are completely new to me. You know, they they might be quite challenging. M maybe a word that I've not met before. Now, you know, in Ofsted's, I shouldn't, if that is the case, I shouldn't have that book. It's far yeah. too challenging for me. It's going to give me words that I've not met before. I, 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 I might even have to think about what they might mean, you know, and work it out for myself or even go and have a look in a dictionary, look it up, you know, 
I, I find it all I mean I remember back as a child reading books that I didn't my brother was a great reader he would give me a book and I'd read it and some of it I wouldn't understand but I'd still finish the book mm. you know mm. the fact that I couldn't read every single word didn't really prevent me from enjoying the book it actually I think enhanced my learning you know from that experience but it's uh, I don't know honestly I feel as though it's I, I do feel as though we're in a, a I say we because you still feel connected to it, but I feel as though we're in a really bad place with this one. Um, anyway, there's been a ministerial resignation this morning. <laughs> the Deputy <laughs> Prime Minister, minutes before we came on air, resigned from his position because of a report made by, I think, 28 people in various government departments that he'd bullied. And clearly by resigning, he has accepted the findings of the report or he's resigned because he doesn't accept the findings of the report. I don't know. But actually, you know, I, I, I remember somebody saying to me, you know, uh, even if even I think it was well, somebody we know very well, Stan, very senior inspector in Austin saying, well, you know, if somebody feels though they've been bullied, they have been bullied. Mm. You know, and, and actually the way in which you respond, if you have accidentally bullied somebody you know i don't you know that you didn't mean to do it but I, the way in which you show contrition and the way that you try and resolve that you know um is important because it then if you don't then it, it appears that it can be then part of your nature and it can be a serial issue and if there are if these allegations have been borne out with the report then actually that's quite a serious weakness in character isn't it and certainly wouldn't want to see that in a leadership person that i you know that i had to work with no it's it's understanding leadership that seems to be missing mm. yeah, it's, it's not about being the boss it's not about it's not about being the most important person mm. in the room it's about leading everybody else what, why is that so difficult yeah mm. mind you when when there's was it in the afghanistan retreat and that minister was on a holiday Yes, but not in the sea because the sea was closed. Closed, yeah. But it, there were only two phone calls during that period of time, apparently. That's mm -hmm. real leadership, isn't it? I mean, in a way, have there been moments, Andy, in your career where you thought, oh, holy, I, I don't really want to be the leader. This is a really big issue and I don't really want this, you know, but actually you have to front it up, don't you? Yeah, this is just one I can um, think about, Frank. And let Andy go first, Stan. Let Andy well, go. I think I must have been very fortunate because I can't think of of an issue, of a time like that. And I think the reason for that is that, that the people, the team I'd got around me were incredibly strong. You know, the people came from different backgrounds, ages, experiences, and I could trust them. And I think building up that trust with a leadership team is, is crucial. And that so that when those big decisions came along, I think because you, I knew that as, if I communicated and if I took the accountability, at the end of the day, it was on my shoulders and that the team would tell me if I got it wrong, <laughs> you know, and they had the confidence that they could tell me, you know, it, and that's quite big because to actually say to your boss, no, hang on a minute, that's, that's not the, what's best. And uh, then I, I wasn't put in a situation where I was making decisions, not quite on the hoof, but decisions that I might regret later because I felt that, you know, we'd work together. We got it through. If it did go wrong, they didn't always go right. You know, at least you could explain why those decisions have been made and you could be accountable and you could be prepared to, to change, you know, to go back and say, hang on, we didn't get that one right. I say we there. <laughs> yeah, well, that. That's interesting because in all of that you said we, didn't we? And the team. There were all those <laughs> phrases about not about it's not about you. Yeah. And I mean, when we when we became the academy, we made changes to that leadership team, which um, caused us caused a stir within that team. You know, and this was one of the things that to be fair, the co-op advised and DFE advised that we needed to shake things up a bit. And um, and that helped, you know, the first mm -hmm. it, it took some managing, but it helped and was better for the team in the long term and for the for the youngsters and the academy and the whole thing going forward. So 
you know, back to your original question, you know, because I think of the background and how you set things up, you can perhaps avoid having those very challenging situations. Yeah. Go on, Stan, you were going to say. I, you've I got just one. thought that as, as Andy's been speaking there, I, I've just thought the one areas where I feel as though I wish I wasn't here have all been where I've been delivering somebody else's agenda. Uh, not not mine so i haven't done all the things i I haven't set it up i haven't got that firm belief um in fact on one occasion i I actually didn't believe in the stuff i was having to do which was um to do with disciplinary but um i I didn't find well i didn't think that the the process was was fair to the people who were Mm. and yet it was it was me who had to front it up so uh, yeah, there are those occasions, and on looking back, I think I, I w- would wish I'd been stronger to say no, I'm not doing that. Although uh, uh, one particular one, my, you know, I was told by somebody very, very high up in the authority that if I didn't do it, then I'd be the next one down the road. Yeah, which mm-hmm. is bullying, which I should have stood up to, but yeah. didn't. No. But that's that's part of your learning, isn't it? Yeah, I've only I've only felt when I was an HMI, I only felt bullied once um, by a particular manager, um, and that again, I you try and deal with it, you know, you try and deal with I, well, I tried to deal with it on a personal basis with that individual, but in, on reflection, I you know I really should have raised it much further up the food chain, um, but I, I, I do I, I think I've looked at now knowing that the way that people you know, things that happen, you know, things do happen, don't they? But actually the way in which people, leaders front up problems and the, they manage it, you know, I think that's for me. And they take all of the, all the, I think we've spoken before about this issue about the, the Kent primary school, that, that in effect leaders need, particularly of Ofsted, need to just front it up, get everything out and just say, this is where we're going. This is what's happening. You know that then just closes that down what what and I, and you know I, I do respect people that that can do that mm. and, and there's that sense of you know honesty about it um because i think most people I, understand that these things happen you know but it's the I way think there's also that other side of leadership that i'm sure andy's experienced i know you have is when you you're taking the tough decisions and yourself are, are uncertain as to whether this is the way to go and yet you stick by it because you've got some kind of gut instinct that says, yeah, actually, this is what we need. And it comes to fruition. Yeah, There's an absolute euphoric sense of, I got that right. And I then think you stray also, on to something else. <laughs> yeah. What's important almost is preparation. Yeah. And, and just thinking about the decision before you take it. And yeah. if anything, perhaps I my thoughts would be i overthink wow. <laughs> you know <laughs> even down to doing stuff around the house i think of what what could go wrong <laughs> you know, before i do it it's much the frustration of my wife <laughs> uh but it, but in you know in those management situations where you sort of try and think through well what if what if and i suppose what if and there perhaps were times where you, i should ignore the what i just dive in but but you don't then have to sort of come back and yeah. um, excuses yeah. when it's gone wrong. I think that preparation side is, is really important. Yeah. 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 Mm. Right, Andy, um, we've 40 minutes already. Goes really quickly, yeah. doesn't it? Uh, yeah. Finish these chats with uh, giving our guests a chance to sort of say, you know, what, what would they like to see as a, as a change to improve education in England? What, what have you got to offer on that front? <laughs> My original one, when, when you, you mentioned this, was around the, the judgments at schools and um, being based more on where on people destinations as a more accurate reflection of how a school had performed with those youngsters and, and needs being perhaps the defining influence on the judgment. I mean, within that, attendance is key and, and careers, information and guidance, I think it is massive. And uh, there's been a lot of good work done in a couple of schools in Stoke, the, uh, the Meridian Academy, or Mr Meridian and St Margaret Ward, where they've very much linked curriculum to careers outcomes, which gave a relevance to the youngsters very much of, of the you know, of areas of the curriculum they were following. 
So not all young people develop at the same rate, you know, that where they are at key stage two, where they're expected to be at the end of key stage four can be very different. And, you know, but where those youngsters move on to with the skills that they've got, the qualifications they're going to need as well to move on, I think would be a much better reflection of educational outcomes than, than just based on you know those GCSE results which as we mentioned before there's a limitation on those as to what percentage you're going to pass them anyway yeah, so that's certainly, unfortunately it would, it would undermine the drive free back he says sarcastically what a shame. yeah which to me was which is so wrong you know fit, at least 50 percent of the youngsters are following a grammar school cur curriculum which isn't suited to them you know and, and the reduction in that wider curriculum you know the arts sport technical areas it's, it's just been so wrong which has happened since what you know about 2013 14 onwards yeah you know, which has been can very you, very can very you imagine how much more support would go into into young people moving on to jobs and apprenticeships and college and university if that was a judgment yeah. it, it would it would completely change what was yeah. going on in schools particularly in those last two years so it wouldn't all be about cramming you for these exams. It would be about preparing you for your next stage. That's right. Uh, and for some exams which youngsters are taking within that EBA, they're never going to follow up those areas again. No. You know, I mean, even when I went to a grammar school, I mean, I took the arts route as opposed to the science route, you know. So, you know, going way back into the what the, the late 1960s, you know, we, we didn't have to follow the subjects that weren't going to be relevant to us, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, uh, obviously, if we were in charge, everything would be fine. Um, it's <laughs> obvious, isn't it? Just a, a heavy dose of Frankenstein chat on a Friday uh, sorts out all the ills of society, or at least within education. But Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thanks, Andy. Great seeing thank you again. Pleasure. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, love to have you back. We say that all the time to all our guests. So uh, I'll throw something in for 2024. And uh, hopefully we'll st our hearts will still be beating then. And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so we're back again next week, Stan. Uh, so uh, thanks everybody for, for watching and listening and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.